What's cracking? Big dogs. Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. Big dogs gotta eat. They were talking a little free agency, running backs in particular, for probably four different reasons. Let me try to think of them off the top of my head. One, because they're the only position that fucking matters in fantasy football. Two, because the SEO is booming on anything running backs. You put running backs in the title of a YouTube video, 17x number of views, the number of people that care. I'm only here to make things that y'all care about. And that's the only two reasons I really got for it. But there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of big names that were in the free agent market. Some of them stayed put. We're gonna talk about the biggest winners, the biggest running back winners in free agency this year for 2021 fantasy football. You hear that YouTube? 2021, 2021 fantasy football. Put that in your CCs, put that in your caption and fucking spread me all over YouTube, baby. Maybe we'll do one for wide receivers. Maybe we'll talk about the losers at the end of the episode real quick. And that's that. So without further ado, tuck your shirt in. Stop yelling and let's eat. If at any point y'all enjoy the video, all I ask of you, all I beg of you is to hit the button that looks like this. It's about 14 centimeters below the actual video itself. It looks like this, not the one that looks like this. Subscribe to the channel if you're new because we're covering fantasy football, dynasty, rookie, season long, redraft, bunch of shenanigans behind the scenes for the rest of my life pretty much. So subscribe to the channel if you give a fuck about any of those things. Winner number one. And this is in no particular order, but this might be in, in order of guys that I like the most. Cause I fucking love Chris Carson. I really love Chris Carson. I am, I am ecstatic for this man that he was able to re-sign with the Seahawks. He was linked to a few different teams. We heard Miami. I was making up rumors that Buffalo was interested in signing him. I just would have liked the landing spot, but he lands back with Seattle. It's two years, 14.6 million, something like that. I believe there might even be like a third year on the contract, but it's voidable. I don't know why like everyone just decided to make voidable contracts this year. No one had ever really heard about it before this year. And then all of a sudden, we're just going to start handing out seven year contracts, but six years of them are voidable. I don't, I don't really know like who wins in that situation. I'm not really sure uh, where that came from but it's a popular thing and i believe that's what happened with chris carson two years 14.6 million dollars this dude is basically without a doubt he has given his entire body soul skin heart tears he's gonna have cte because of seattle so the least they could do is pay this man like a decent salary and and they did that they could have took him off and thrown him away like a used condom but probably against their best interest they decided to put it back on you know that's a that's a running back shouldn't get paid joke there not a good one not a good one we're talking about practice and practicing these jokes. Not a good one. But I'm glad Chris Carson's back with the team. Here's what we'll say, man. Chris Carson's coming. Uh, he's coming off a down year. He's coming off a down year. And uh, if any of you guys have gotten into the investing game over the last couple of months, over the last year or so, this would be the, the Seahawks buying a dip, I would say. Okay. Because you look at some of the numbers. 2020, he was injured. He missed some time. But you look at his rushing performances over the last couple of years. Chris Carson, 100 plus yard rushing games. 2018, six of them. 2019, six of them. 2020, Take a guess. If you're listening via podcast, you don't see the zero up on the screen right now. I would head over to YouTube if I were you. So zero games of 100 plus rushing yards in 2020 after having six in each of the last two seasons. Again, though, injury plagued. Carson was banged up for most of the year. Probably led to the dip in overall volume, led to the dip in 100 plus rushing games, whatever, whatever, whatever. You look back at 2019, if you discount Chris Carson's week 16, this is talking about the 2019 season, not the 2020 season. Basically, he got injured, but in the games that he was not injured in 2019, he had 16 or more touches in 93% of the games, 18 or more touches in 86% of the games. You fast forward to 2020, Carson played in 12 regular season games. Comparing it to 2019, I just want to look at the overall volume. So in 2019, 16 or more touches in 93% of the games. 2020, 16 or more touches in just 50% of the games. So the volume dips, but on an efficiency level, right? This is what we're trying to figure out. Carson gets signed to be the starting running back again in Seattle. Will he get the volume? Most likely. I think they signed him to be the guy that he's been for the last couple of years. Is he still good enough to return that RB1, RB2 value in which you're going to have to draft him at? I think the answer is yes. You look at the efficiency numbers. He was as good as ever. You're looking at the raw totals career high in yards per carry at 4.8. He averaged just 
0.2 fewer fantasy points per game in 2020 than he did in 2019. And the more exciting part is when you look at his per game receiving numbers. If you pace out what he had last year in the 12 games in which he was limited on snaps because he was injured, he's looking at 61 targets, nearly 50 receptions, 383 receiving yards. So you pace that out for a full 16. That's a nice fucking hefty chunk. It's a nice hefty chunk of receiving production from a guy that you don't look at as a pass catching running back. Carson is just 26 years old. He's not old. He's been in the league for a while. He's he's been banged up. He's taken a lot of he's taken a lot of shots to the body, but he's he's not old by any means, right? 26 years old and nothing in this backfield has proven to be any sort of competition for him. You have Rashad Penny, you have DJ Dallas, you have Travis Homer. You look at underdog's ADP, right? We're going to be using underdog fantasy's ADP from here on out because that's the sharpest in the industry right now. Underdog ADP has Chris Carson as the running back 23, 46th overall pick. Talking about the back end of the fourth round. I mean, you can give me that all day and tomorrow and the day after that. Huge winner in free agency getting that re-signing deal. After Chris Carson, we got Chase Edmonds, man. Kenny Drake's gone to Las Vegas, but this leaves the backfield open to Chase Edmonds in Arizona. Or so the Cardinals proclaim. You know, we've had some comments throughout the offseason. Cardinals head coach Cliff Kingsbury said the coaching staff is confident Chase Edmonds can serve as the team's primary running back. I get it. You know, like they're not going to not say that he's the only fucking back they got in the backfield right now. They're going to give him a vote of confidence and then they're probably going to draft somebody. But you look at Chase Edmonds last year, he's coming off of career high in touches. Kenyon Drake was banged up a little bit, but it was 150 touches. Okay. So we're yet to see him really handle a big workload in the NFL. That's a red flag. We don't know if he can hold one hold up over the course of the season because he is a smaller frame running back, but two, and more importantly, when we talk about guys who have never had a big workload, a big volume touch count, the bigger concern is can you actually be efficient over the course of the season when you get a bigger workload? Does your body wear down? Does that affect your speed? Does that affect your fucking fast twitch muscle fibers? What's going to happen with Chase? This could be what, what, here, there's a few things that could happen, right? They could draft somebody and becomes a backfield by committee. The other thing that could happen is, is, is similar to like Austin Eckler, right? Where Austin Eckler was a really, really, really efficient, solid role player in that backfield for the Chargers for a long time until he was forced into the starting role and then he explodes. There was two games last year or two games over the last couple of years where Kenyon Drake has been out and Chase Edmonds has served as the unincumbent starter for the Cardinals. He had 28 and 29 touches in those two games. There is nothing to challenge him on the depth chart, right? I know a lot of, I even like, you know, I like, you know, Benjamin, right? As a prospect, I think he was a good player. I think he could, he has a, he's a wide skill set, but we're not actually going to sit here and argue that he's going to make an impact. The guy literally had zero touches last year, literally had zero fucking touches last year. Okay. So just, just, just fucking save your propaganda that has absolutely no logical backing to it. Backing is a fake fucking word, biking to it. Just, just hold your Eno Benjamin bullshit propaganda for me right now until he starts making moves, okay? Until he does something on the field, I don't want to hear about it. It's Chase Edmonds' backfield. The thing we're obviously looking out here for when it comes to the Cardinals in their backfield is the draft. Now, there was one really, really important move that happened this offseason for the Cardinals, and it was trading their third-round pick to the Raiders for the center Rodney Hudson. Did two things. It was a double fucking dagger for Chase Edmonds. I don't mean he's getting daggered. I mean, he's throwing fucking daggers out here. Chase Edmonds threw two daggers with that one move. One, it gets Rodney Hudson, which improves the offensive line. You improve the offensive line. If so, facto, the math adds up. That's good for a running back. Two, that gets rid of their third round pick, right? Third round pick. Those middle rounds are the premier rounds to be taking a running back that's going to replace or at least cause a committee for a guy like Chase Edmonds. So you look at the rest of their picks. Now, the Cardinals have the 16th overall pick in the first round. I would be shocked if they took a first round running back at 16 overall. More egregious things have happened, right? The Raiders took Josh Jacobs in the first round and then they just signed Kenyon Drake. So that was that was borderline as egregious as the Cardinals taking someone. So I would I would go out on a limb saying they're not going to take anyone at the 16th overall pick. Then they have the 49th overall pick in the second round. If they do not take a running back with that 49th pick in the second round, they don't have another pick until the fifth round. So if Chase can fucking skirt his way past that second round pick without them taking a running back, he's in the clear. And the Chase... Oof. The chase is on. The chase is fucking on to chase Chase Edmonds away from the touches that he's going to get in this backfield, okay? So despite his size, Chase is a three-down player. The cards have shown that they can do that. They will are willing to do that with Chase Edmonds. So realistically, man, if they skip on a running back in the first two rounds and they don't take someone until the fifth or sixth round, that's not going to be real competition for Chase Edmonds. That's his job. So if you have Chase Edmonds in Dynasty, this was best case scenario for you. They didn't sign Kenyon Drake. They got rid of their third round pick. Things are looking good. His current ADP right now is running back 27, 
60th overall. That's beautiful. He could be a high-end running back too next year with RB1 upside. I'm, I'm a little hesitant to anoint him just an overall RB1. Again, career high, 150 touches last year. Does he hold up over the course of the season as a workhorse? Can he be good over the course of the season operating as a workhorse? I would pencil him in as like a high-end RB2 in my rankings, which will drop in the draft guide semi-soon. I'll probably have him if they don't take a running back in the first couple rounds. He'll probably be in that running back 15 to 18 range, I would assume. Maybe a little bit, a little bit, a little bit higher. Talking about higher ranked running back, how about Mike Davis? The Falcons the Falcons running back group is fucking bike, baby. The only thing more fucking bike than the Falcons are the Knicks. We're all bike. All the sports teams that I love, all the sports teams that I've been lifelong fans of since a couple of weeks ago are back. We're fucking bike, baby. Realistically, I love this signing. I love the Mike Davis signing for the Falcons. This backfield was so fucking bad last year that even Allen Iverson was like, y'all need to practice more. And Mike Davis was a fantasy revelation for those of y'all that had Christian McCaffrey and were able to fill him in with Mike Davis. Obviously, he's not fucking Christian McCaffrey level of skill set, but he did everything that you needed him to do in a three down manner. Okay, he can catch the ball. He can run the ball. He can operate on the goal line. As of right now, Mike Davis is the starter for the Falcons. Currently, Gurley is where he belongs, probably in a fucking ice tub somewhere. And everybody else stinks. Edo Smith, even the one great white hope, of Brian Hill, he's a free agent, so he's gone, okay? And now the draft, just like the Cardinals for the Falcons, will obviously decide the fate of Mike Davis and what his fantasy outcome is or to what degree this, this committee can be in the Atlanta backfield. The, the Falcons will have all of their picks this year except their seventh rounder. They also have three-fifths and two-sixths. So that is like prime time. You know, I, 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 want to, I want to look back at what their historical drafting prowess is when it comes to running backs. You know, do they pay up for running backs? Because some teams have like, you know, some teams just don't pay up for certain positions. They're really good at scouting. They're really good at hitting on them. Other teams are just fucking stupid, plain stupid, and they use draft picks on positionals that on positions that just don't have high value, but they'll continue to not learn from their mistakes. And I was like, are the Falcons one of those fucking teams, you know? Because the Falcons are one of those teams where like everybody is just, Travis Etienne's going to be on the Falcons. Travis Etienne apparently is getting drafted by 17 different teams, the Falcons being one of them. I'm like, how, how realistic is that? Now, going back, I got the numbers here. Falcons haven't selected a running back earlier than the 73rd pick, which is in the third round, since TJ Duckett in 2002. But they do have a new GM now coming over from the Saints, Terry Fontenot, a new coach, Arthur, Arthur Smith. So everything about the drafting and the and that kind of shit might be out the window, okay? They saw massive success with Derrick Henry last year, uh, you know, under Arthur Smith. So I'm not saying that it won't happen. I'm not saying they're not looking at a guy like Najee Harris. But Arthur Smith is going to bring a far more balanced offense to Atlanta, which I think good for all the running backs involved. What we do know is what Mike Davis is, right? He's a guy who can do everything again. He's not explosive, but he will stay on the field for forever and he's going to be fine doing that he was fourth among running backs last year in receptions the Falcons didn't really pass their running backs and neither did Arthur Smith but whatever this is a great signing for Mike Davis right now currently running back 39 off the board 111th overall per underdog ADP I'll be drafting Mike Davis even even if they grab a, a I would see them grabbing a speedster in the draft you know think of like a Chuba Hubbard if he goes in the third fourth round think of Javion Hawkins if you want to wait to like the fourth fifth round to you know pair a more explosive back with a guy like Mike Davis right and there you go you got explosivity you've got Explosivity is that is that a real word? Explosiveness, explosivity. Th you got thump, you got thump, daddy, Mike Davis. You got goal line work there. You got ex you know you just got everything. If you if you draft one explosive running back, the Falcons backfield is fucking back, baby. Another low key winner in free agency, I think, is Miles Sanders. Man, I don't think most people are thinking of Miles Sanders as a winner, but I do, man, because they could have went out. Clearly, they wanted to get a thicker back. They tried to do it with Jordan Howard last year, and now it's Miles Sanders and it's Boston Scott. Jalen Hurts basically gone ahead and gotten the nod from the front office up in Philadelphia after moving back from six to the 12th draft spot. They're not going to be looking for drafting a quarterback. And I really like Miles Sanders running behind him over quarterback like Jalen Hurts. I thought Philly could have looked at some of these stumpers. I thought they could have looked at a Mike Davis. I thought they could have looked at a Leonard Fournette. I thought they could have looked at one of these bigger backs to pair with Miles Sanders because he had trouble staying healthy last year. And they've always talked about not wanting to use a committee. And that's a Doug Peterson thing. I get it. I get it. I, th I think all things considered, Miles Sanders was actually a winner in free agency, despite nothing really happening here. Miles Sanders is a guy that's going to be drafted probably in like the third round. And I will have some shares of him again. 
I know we've got some battle scars. A lot of my audience probably has some battle scars with Miles Sanders, but we learn from our mistakes, and we learn from our mistakes by going right fucking back to the well with Miles Sanders. Now, let's switch gears to another Miles. It's Miles Gaskin. The Dolphins were linked to just about every fucking free agent running back at one point or another. Literally, Aaron Jones, Chris Carson, Amir Abdullah, James Conner. Ultimately, they let Matt Breida walk, probably limp away. And uh, they just signed Malcolm Brown. Absolute fucking needle mover. The needle mover Malcolm Brown. Only needle he's moving is the fucking Cam Akers owners he turned into crackheads last year. So any signing any of those big name for agent running backs would have ruined Gaskin, obviously. But, but none of that happened. Here's what we do know. The Dolphins want to use a workhorse running back. Some of the stats from Twitter. Make sure you're following me. At Nick Ercolano. Discounting weeks one and two, where the team didn't know who the guy was yet in the beginning of the year. In games, Miles Gaskin has been active. He's averaged 22 opportunities per game. Had fewer than 21 only once. In game, Salvin Ahmed has been active and Gaskin hasn't. He has averaged 18.3 opportunities per game. Fewer than 18 once. That's what we do know. We do know they want to use a workhorse. What we don't know is who that's going to be. And the Dolphins. The Dolphins have stupid fucking draft capital. It is completely front-loaded. When you look at the picks, they've got the 6th pick, the 18th pick, the 4th pick in the 2nd round, the 18th pick in the 2nd round, two more 3rd rounds, a 5th, and two sevenths. I don't know if that necessarily means they're more likely to draft a running back, but what it does mean, having all those picks from rounds 1 to 3, is that if they do go with a running back in the first 3 rounds, much more likely that it's immediate competition for Miles Gaskin. The way I look at draft capital and running backs is this. If you're drafted in the first round, you're going to be looked at as the immediate starter. Second round, immediate committee with starter upside. Third round is immediate opportunity to compete for a big role. Fourth round is upside with uphill battle for immediate role. Round five, once all your favorite fucking running backs start getting picked, Dynasty Twitter is making up fairy tales about how, they're, how they, have, they have a fucking path to being the starter. That's the way I look at it, okay? Anyone within the top three rounds is going to be able to compete immediately for a sizable role in that backfield, which is obviously a cause for concern for Miles Gaskin. But this is a free agency video, all right? Miles Gaskin cleared the way, and they don't have a starter ahead of him right now because they did not sign anybody. Right now, he is currently the RB30 off the board, 80th overall per underdog ADP. I'll be taking some shares there, man. Worst case scenario, you probably have a committee back. If they end up going with Najee or Travis Etienne, you're fucked. But I'd roll the dice. I'd roll the dice a little bit because I think he has real, again, whoever the starter there is, they want to use a workhorse. So 50-50 chance, they come away with a late round running back and he remains the starter and the workhorse there. Aaron Jones, also a workhorse. Also a big time Big time winner in free agency. I love him being bike with Green Bay, okay? I was saying this all offseason. I think the best spot for him would be landing with Green Bay again to continue his career. He gets that fat contract to become and remain the featured workhorse in Green Bay. The reason we loved him coming back to Green Bay is because anytime you move, it, it causes a level of uncertainty what your role is going to be in the new offense. This offense already has incredible upside. They have Aaron Rodgers as their quarterback. They were literally the highest scoring offense in the NFL last year, and they had a great, great offensive line. That is the perfect setup for a guy like Aaron Jones. They lost Corey Lindsley. That was PFF's highest graded center in the NFL. That's going to hurt. He's going over to the Chargers. Regardless though, man, this is, this is an Aaron Rodgers offense. And they're going to be scoring the ball a lot. Highest scoring offense in the NFL last year. Tons of opportunity for Aaron Jones. Aaron Rodgers' 9.1% touchdown rate. 9.1% of his throws went for touchdowns. That is an absurd rate. It was a career high by far, and it's not even going to be close to that number. So when they're on the goal line, look for a lot more of those touchdowns to go Aaron Jones' way, not through the air to Devontae Adams. Jamal Williams is out, which obviously means more pass catching work for Aaron Jones because Jamal Williams took a lot of the targets and the receptions in his Jamal Williams games, okay? A.J. Dillon probably gets a little bit more work on the ground. I would take the sacrifice of having Aaron Jones getting more work through the passing game to give some to fat boy A.J. Dillon on the ground. The Packers, again, willingly somehow chose to forego any of the wide receivers in free agency. So there's a good chance that Aaron Jones is like borderline the second pass catching option on this team again. And it's all good right now. Right now, his ADP is about as high as it can possibly go. Running back eight right now, 12th overall. So he's already a first round pick. Melvin Gordon's another winner here. Philip Lindsay, he gone. He's on the Texans, which is just the fucking most absurd depth chart of running backs I've ever seen. It's Philip Lindsay, it's David Johnson, it's Mark Ingram, it's some guy named fucking Scotty. I don't know what's, no one knows what's going on in Houston. My heart goes out to the people in Houston right now. Strictly from a running back depth chart perspective, right? I don't know what's going on in your personal lives, but just based on that shit, I'm, I, I, I don't know how you're living your lives on a normal basis. Royce Freeman stinks. 
they signed Mike the God Boone. Okay, so that's 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 a move to keep your eye on. But I think I think Melvin Gordon has a chance again to be one of the most underrated high floor running backs too in fantasy football. Most people probably don't know this, but Melvin Gordon literally finished as an RB one last year. He was the running back twelve overall, and he played in fifteen games. He had over eleven hundred total yards and ten touchdowns. There's really no reason that cannot happen again. Uh, do they try to find the next Philip Lindsay in this year's draft? Maybe. Maybe I, a guy I named for the Falcons before, Javion Hawkins, I feel like, and Chuba Hubbard, I feel like both play very similar to Philip Lindsay. We'll see if they go down that route again with, you know, getting a late round value running back. Regardless, Melvin Gordon as the RB26 right now, 55th overall, feels like a phenomenal fucking RB2 if you go with one running back early on in the drafts and you go heavy on wide receivers or you want to dip into that Travis Kelsey kind of shit, right? Then probably not my style of drafting. But if you do do that, Melvin Gordon as an RB2 flex play is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful pick. As is James Robinson, man, because the Jaguars signed Carlos Hyde and that's their big signing. That was the that was the big fucking signing that everybody wanted to sell James Robinson for. Not only did they bring in an underwhelming free agent to compete with James Robinson, but that Carlos Hyde signing basically protects them, protects James Robinson from them drafting any running back in the draft with any sort of real capital. There's no reason to do it anymore, right? Coming away from free, I mean, listen, only some weirdo would actually have thought that the Jaguars were going to spend big money on some running back free. It would make no sense. James Robinson is coming off a monster year. They're not going to go sign fucking Aaron Jones for a $50 million contract. They do have a ton of draft capital, two firsts, two seconds, a third, two fourths, and two fifths, okay? Very likely that they do draft a running back day three with one of those fourths or fifths. I think it's very, very likely it happens. But I doubt it's in the first two days. And if that's the case, it is still 100% James Robinson's job to lose. Current ADP running back 18, 29th overall. I think that's perfect for him. I think that draft spot is about as as perfect as it can be. And I would consider him a buy there. He's probably not going to have a ceiling like he did last year based on volume alone because he's not going to get 95% of the opportunities and the touches. Carlos Hyde will get some of those. But he's going to be one of the highest floor players in an ascending offense. It's going to have Trevor Lawrence now. They've got more weapons on the outside. It's going to move a lot more smoothly. He's going to have more scoring opportunities, and they show that they have no fucking problem throwing him the ball. So James Robinson, big winner in free agency. I just I just think the people selling James Robinson were pretty fucking dumb to begin with. From a business owner perspective, you look at James Robinson, there's nothing wrong with him. You don't fix him. You don't spend money on a part of your business, on an asset in your business that doesn't need fixing. Am I buying a new fucking printer when my printer works already? No. Do I need... Uh, bad example. I do need new lightings or to figure out how to fucking light this place up. Do I need a new lens? Do I need a new camera? No, I don't. I'd also buy new lens when I don't need them, but you guys get the fuck. I'm just a bad business owner. People who run NFL franchises are not bad business people. Eh, fuck, fuck, fuck. This is a really bad argument, but y'all get what I mean. All right. James Robinson, big time winner. That is my list of free agent running back winners. Let me know who I missed out. Let me know some of the losers that y'all got. I'm not going to do a whole ass video because I don't, I don't think there were that many losers outside of the Kenyon Drakes and the Josh Jacobs that I already named. Obviously AJ Dillon is a big loser because his upside had Aaron Jones gone elsewhere would have been big. Would have been, it would have been as big as his fucking thighs, but didn't happen. So drop some of your losers down below. Drop some of your favorite winners down below. Let me know some of the other positions. Let me know some of the content y'all want to see going forward. And that's it. Tomorrow on FTP, we're doing a live stream. We're going to be doing an, uh, a mock draft, NFL mock draft first round. I think we're going to do maybe the first 8, 12, 16 picks. I don't really know what the fuck's going on. I never know what's going on in my business anymore. As you could see by that James Robinson spiel. Hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you're new to the channel. I love y'all. I'm out.